AI gameplay programmer at uh, Ubisoft Quebec City in Canada. I'm super happy to be with you today um, to talk about uh, AI improvements that we did on uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Then afterwards, uh, share a couple of uh, best practices uh, accumulated over the years. So let me switch to the presentation. Here we go. So a little bit about myself, and uh, yes, that's me on the picture. Uh, I've been studying at University of Sherbrooke in Canada in software engineering, graduated a while ago. Uh, so you can guess my age. Uh, my first job was to start developing real-time embedded software for power lines automation controllers. Uh, always been super passionate about AI. So I had the opportunity to join a startup, which was called uh, Victim Human Bionics, to develop the AI of a motorized prosthetic leg named the Power Knee, which is commercialized by a company from Iceland, uh, Osher. Then I uh, joined the video game industry in 2005 as an AI and gameplay programmer. My first steps in the gaming industry was to work on a couple of licensed games, but my first uh, quote unquote AAA game on a more, let's say, known license was on uh, Prince of Persia Forgotten Sands, where I worked as a, an AI programmer. Then after Prince of Persia, I switched uh, to the Assassin's Creed franchise, still working uh, or being involved more or less in AI. Uh, on Revelations, I worked on the carriage driving NPCs AI. And then on Blackfly, uh, I worked on naval systemic ingredients. Towards, I worked on the Freedom Cry DLC, uh, mainly worked on the systemic events, uh, spawning and spawning like small uh, quests around the player managing NPCs and win-lose conditions. After I, I briefly worked on Assassin's Creed Unity to help them with the massive crowd system. Then uh, my biggest title and involvement so far uh, was on the latest Assassin's Creed title in the franchise. For that, uh, and it's going to be the topic, the main topic of that presentation, we had to overhaul the whole AI to support a uh, huge systemic and dynamic world. So enough about me. Uh, let's jump into the heart of the presentation. And it's going to be split into two main parts, uh, obviously, and carefully named part one and part two. Um, so first one is uh, about improving the NPC's navigation and pathfinding in a fully dynamic and systemic environment. And then, as I was saying, the, a couple of best practices are, I'm going to be sharing. Let's start part one. So beforehand, I need to give you uh, the context of uh, where we had to work uh, AI-wise on the AC Syndicate. The game is taking place in 1868, Victorian London, uh, which was during the Industrial Revolution. So when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, uh, we have to say that the whole world was in motion. Uh, we had massive crowd everywhere, pedestrians on you know, sidewalks, park, and the streets all over the place. Because London was, at that time, considered like the center of the world. Uh, we also had massive carriages traffic in the streets, massive both traffic and the Thames River, but also, uh, at last not the least, a whole net railroad, railroad network with trains having their own schedules and train stations and stuff like that. An interesting fact for us is, uh, it was the first Assassin's Creed game where we could uh, use real photographs for our research, which helped a lot. So let's show a photograph. This is how Lennon was looking back then. Uh, so, you know, using archives like that as a primary for the vision, uh, on our side on AI, we're like, okay, how, how we will render all this and, you know, render the, the, the vision and the fantasy in, in our game. What is a NPC in the, the Industrial Revolution? Well, 
the NPC needs to steer around obstacles. Some of them uh, will have weird, shape and weird and arbitrary shapes. The NPC also needs to switch from ground navigation to driving a carriage and that back and forth. And to add more dynamism and excitement, uh, we want the NPCs to jump to moving vehicles from the ground or another moving vehicles. Here's a screenshot that portrays a quite chaotic setup where you can see the player driving a fire truck with uh, the red NPC climbing on it on the, on the back. And you can see another red NPC standing on top of another carriage just about to jump on the player's vehicle. And on top of that, there's the whole world life with the carriage traffic, pedestrians and stuff. So to sum up, it's quite a challenge. So how can we achieve that vision uh, technically? We built a road network to provide an abstraction layer for the street's topology. Then uh, we implemented a traffic manager to handle massive carriages driving in the streets in some sort of organized way. We had to rework, rework the navigation mesh system. Then we had to rework steering engine for the NPCs, rework the decision-making systems, and finally we virtualized the, uh, the NPCs. Here you can see a screenshot in the editor with the bug display representing the lanes and directions of the traffic uh, with pedestrians crossing path as well. This is what we call the road network. Then uh, the traffic manager will take care of the carriages flow in the whole city, making, making sure there's no traffic jam, unless there's a gameplay region, of course. The traffic manager will also manage the interaction between the moving carriages and the pedestrians. For example, when there's a, a, there are enough pedestrians about to cross the street, a virtual roadblock will be created and the traffic manager will stop the traffic to let pedestrians cross the street. Another thing is that for gameplay reason and uh, to give AI a chance, we decided to design the roads larger than normal to give enough space. Here's an in-game screenshot uh, that shows how it look like, looks like. First, uh, let's talk about the anatomy of a carriage. This is the different parts and concepts of a vehicle. We have the horse, which is the tractor. We have the carriage in itself, the joint. Those are the seats where uh, NPCs can sit. Ready? And those are the interaction links. Typically, it's entry and exit positions. Nav mesh patching. So, Patching is the process of removing shapes uh, from dynamic objects from the nav mesh. We are creating holes, actually. But when we are recomputing the triangles layout, uh, since you know we have a horse, joint, and carriage, it will generate weird and concave shapes. And by having those kind of weird shapes, uh, some valid paths will be completely blocked and invalidated. This process is heavy on the CPU, so uh, we decided to cap one patch process per frame, giving priority to uh, the vehicles that were closest to the player. This is a very simple use case where the horse and the carriage are in a straight line, and uh, we can see how it, it looks like. So the green part, the green area is the nav mesh uh, per se. On top of that, we'll use what we call whiskers links to connect uh, dynamic to static objects. Uh, sorry, dynamic to static nav meshes. They are dynamically created during the patching process. Uh, it creates some uh, jump links for NPCs. And by doing that, we are improving coverage and we provide more navigations option to the NPCs. That process is not flawless because, you know, we know we are adding more options for the NPCs, but we know that we are not totally covering the area. But you know, in our game, it was it was really good enough. Here's uh, the another really simple example of uh, 
with your links. So you can see that there's a nav the, the top of the carriage is a small nav mesh, and there are links uh, on both sides and on the back of the carriage. Here's a real life uh, in game that shows how nav mesh patching and whisker links cre creation will look in the game world. Uh, so you know, the, the pink and orange arrows are different jump options, uh, jump transition option for the NPCs. You can see by uh, the position of the horses uh, from their carriages, the weird shapes that it is creating. Uh, and you can see like in the middle, there's some really odd shape uh, nav mesh. This is uh, the challenge for the steering engine. So let's see how we did that. We had to reward, re reward the steering because typically in Assassin's Creed, the avoidance was radius based. But with carriages, uh, radius based avoidance produces very anchored paths with huge dead zones. It's pretty obvious, uh, you know, the dead zone, if we use a ra radius based avoidance, the dead zone is gonna be inside the red circle. And it makes no sense, you know, if, if the NPC can't navigate on both sides of the carriages, it will just like, won't work at all. So given that the nav mesh patching process results in weird and concave shapes, um, we had to implement new steering methods and uh, it's all depending on the start and destination positions of the NPCs. That method uh, is called convex all steering. Let's go back to the game world example that we saw earlier, giving that horse joint carriage shape in blue. Uh, we're gonna use it for uh, the example. So construction of the convex hull. First, we need to build the hull by starting with the simplified shape of the horse and carriage. We will use the uh, rigid body extents. Then, We'll iterate on the edges of the outline and test for intersection with the next shape. When there's a collision, we'll switch to the other shape and continue the process up to a complete loop. This will give us the contour. Now from the contour, we'll iterate on the edges going clockwise to clear, clear out all the convex shapes. Uh, when there's a potential convex shape, we'll just like go backward and continue to trace. So, the outline, this is the hull. First part of the steering algorithms is uh, outside, outside. This is the most common use case where both uh, start and destination's position are outside the hull. For the first use case, it's quite obvious. We'll just go straight line uh, since there's no obstruction. There we go. For that example, we'll first clear the edge, then go straight to the destination. Outside, inside now. This case will happen uh, when the NPC wants to interact with the vehicle. First, we'll use uh, outside, outside steering algorithm to clear the contour. Uh, and then when there's no obstruction left, we'll just go straight to destination. Inside, outside, the other way around. So this one will happen when a NPC gets off a vehicle. Uh, first, we'll use the shortest path possible to reach the extent of the hull. Then we'll clear the edge and walk straight into the destination. So by using those three uh, use cases gardens, we are able to cover all our use cases for uh, NPC steering. <clears throat> so let's move to uh, decision-making system uh, in that dynamic world. Uh, but before we, uh, I, I just briefly talk about the loading bubble. So for per performance's reason, the NPC's lifetime is player-centric. That means that the NPCs that are far from the player are truly fake NPCs with very limited AI, graphics, and animations. Think uh, level of detail. 
this has been working like that uh, like for years in in the in Assassin's Creed, but uh, since we added dynamic vehicles, uh, we have a really challenging use case. For example, you know the case where the NPCs are chasing the player. Uh, the player will probably like get on a vehicle to run away, but by running away in that in that vehicle, it will move much faster. So while the NPC is uh, sorry, while the player is uh, running away, the NPCs will try to get their own vehicle to chase him. But as the player is moving quite fast, the NPCs will be unloaded. Then you have a major exploit, and we don't like exploits in video games. So what we'll do is that we'll use virtual NPCs and virtual vehicles. We have, as we saw earlier, six NPC slots per vehicle. So we will group NPCs to minimize vehicles quantity when they are virtualized. For gameplay, obvious gameplay reasons, we need to um, take fashion into account when we are grouping them. We will keep very simple persistent data, the health, the visuals, and the target of the vehicles. That's it. And for gameplay reasons, uh, virtual vehicles must be displayed on the minimap, so the player always know um, who is uh, chasing him. Even when virtualized, the vehicles still need to have minimal behaviors. So we have a simple chase, a simple search uh, when NPCs lost the player and are looking for him, and simple follow for the player's allies. So in short, uh, virtualized vehicles don't have their own AI anymore. They're managed by the traffic manager using the road network. So de-virtualizing. It's based on player proximity, and the respawning process is managed by the traffic manager by creating a hole in the traffic or by just replacing a vehicle that is out of the player's field of view. Um, we cheat a lot with the, with the camera's field of view. And the player and all NPCs must be respawned at the same time to avoid popping. So that covered the AI improvements that we did on AC Syndicates. Uh, now let's talk about a couple of best practices in gaming. Doors, one of my favorite topic. Uh, there, there's a there's a web link. You should really, really read that blog post about doors. It's quite hilarious, but it is very true. Uh, doors need rules and clear rules. Uh, for example, opening and closing doors, and you know, is the player and the NPCs can interact with the door. If then, uh, what happens? When a player and an NPC tries to open the same door at the same time, who has priority? How does it work? Uh, more technical stuff. Can the nav mesh or pathfinding be obstructed by an open door? So if there's an NPC stuck by an open door, it will just like look uh, look stupid and um, could even create like a walkthrough breaks in some missions. Exploits, uh, queuing, like if there are multiple NPCs waiting for the same door, uh, you know, they look dumb and the player can just shoot them or kill them one by one. And uh, there you go, easy fix. We also need to think about uh, nav mesh erosion. Uh, basically, uh, what is uh, nav mesh erosion is that, you know, uh, when their nav, nav meshes are created, they're not perfectly tight, uh, tightly fit with the uh, world geometry. So there's always some sort of a, a buffer all around all around the world. So we always need to make sure that the NPCs have enough space to pathfind and steer uh, through doors. Same rule applies for like uh, narrow corridors, for example. So in my opinion, uh, confined spaces plus door is really the AI's progr AI programmer's worst nightmare. Honestly, think about doors and if you can avoid them. Or if you find really good solutions, uh, send me an email. I'm always interested to discuss about doors. Next topic is about heights, rooftops, and ladders. It's a super important topic because there's a dependency with the game world design. Um, you know, in, in AAA games or games developed by uh, big teams, 
you always need to make sure that the world, uh, building the world and world design is aligned with the game design and the different systems and features of the game. So a thing to tackle really early is that where NPCs can go in that game world. Uh, and that's a vital part because, you know, building worlds uh, is, is expensive and you don't want to have to scrap some good work uh, to remake some parts uh, because we need to, to fix some uh, NPCs for finding. As I was saying, it's crucial that world design is aligned with game design. Make sure that NPCs can have as many climbing routes as possible so they don't bottleneck on ladders and queue like stupids. Same, same rule than uh, doors. Another great topic within that topic is staircases. Uh, if you have midi combat and staircases, uh, it's complex. Make sure they are large enough and not too steep. You might even have to have a simpler fight move sets, uh, so uh, it makes sense and it, it looks good in, in staircases. If NPCs can jump up on higher platforms, make sure there are many routes available again to avoid the same queuing problem. And if you have rooftops and platforms, Make sure they are large enough to facilitate NPCs navigation and double, and it was a triple better than the nav mesh. A tiny nav mesh will result in NPCs falling down. We know why, but the player, uh, the player's perspective will be that they fall down for no reason and that there's a poor AI in the game. Here's one of my favorite examples to illustrate queuing. Uh, in Shadow of Mordor, the player can kite NPCs to a ladder and just then climb up and kill them one by one. And let's be honest, for the record, you can also do that in Assassin's Creed in some locations, but uh, I will let the viewers find those locations. Better looking NPCs. That's quite a general topic, but it's still very important. Why? Because it improves the player's general perception of AI. And uh, you'll hear that uh, expression quite often, the perception of AI. Uh, you don't want the NPCs moving and behavior feeling more, um, like you don't, you don't want them to feel robotic. You want them to feel natural. You don't want a player to feel this the sequence of actions. You, know, you don't want a player to feel like the, the state machine uh, being executed uh, on the NPCs. I was talking about general perception of AI. Uh, the point is you can have the best decision-making and pathfinding algorithms in the modern world, but if your NPCs look bad, this is what the player will remember. For him, it's gonna be, oh, the AI is poor. So what can you do to improve that? Uh, on navigation, you can uh, smooth the planet turns. So the NPCs are not like turning like robots. You can smooth the uh, obstacles avoidance by adding a bit of noise and randomness. You can make sure that the NPCs will face uh, the destination orientation when they reach it, uh, not like after. It's better to, to, to you know, change the ori orientation of the NPCs while he's uh, walking upon destination than make him turn afterwards. You can uh, make sure that there's as much uh, coverage as possible for the Pathfinder. And you can also induce uh, intents into Pathfinding with uh, adding look at, for example. Another way to improve the look of your NPCs is to have uh, animation and body layering. Basically having your uh, action coupled in different layers. You have uh, full body layers. For example, uh, triggering, a, triggering an alarm, reacting to a threat, uh, exploding and tripping and tri a trip mine, uh, some sort of like complete actions. Then you have lower body actions, uh, walking, running, everything uh, that the legs are doing. On the opposite, you have the upper body actions, uh, pointing at the player, uncheating a weapon, poking into a hide spot, etc. Focus actions, look at. And you can have like voiceovers. Voiceovers, uh, they provide an excellent sign and feedbacks at really low cost. We'll talk about VOs after. Here's a very simple example to illustrate uh, layering. So instead of sequencing the actions one by one, 
that and you know doing that feels robotic and uh, state machine ish. Uh, just layer them to be triggered simultaneously. Uh, when you know the, the, or you can predict the length of your action, uh, let's say uh, instead of reaching the hide spot, then uncheating the weapon, then searching that hide spot, let's just start uncheating the weapon while the NPC is wa walking and just like um, starting search uh, before reaching destination. It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science, but it really improves uh, the way the NPCs are moving. I was talking about voiceovers and animations. Uh, you know, by just quote unquote adding animations and VOs, you can produce a lot of variety and flavor uh, to improve and help the, the perception of the AI at very low cost and low risk. It is magic. Do it. It's it's real magic. Uh, and you know, since it's magic, you don't even have to uh, change the gameplay and design rules. It will just give a good feedback for the players. Uh, two of my favorite examples, uh, you know, in the Batman Arkham games, when Batman jumps into his, uh, a setup and uh, NPCs are seeing him, uh, they became nervous. And nervous NPC would just like use different walk cycle, different animation, play VOs in, here and there. Um, it's a great way to set the mood uh, in a setup. Also in Metal Gear Solid games, uh, you know, the NPCs will talk to each other. It's, it's quite stupid. They're, they're talking in, in the virtual radio, uh, just in the speakers and the, or the headphones of the player. Uh, you know, like the guard in the, that watchtower that will tell his friend at the underground that the, look in a specific direction, look in that spot, maybe he's there. Uh, so it, without a huge cost, it will, it will just give a sense of uh, group organization and uh, coordination. Then uh, more technical uh, stuff, uh, testing and coverage. You know, don't think everything will go as planned. We know this, shit will hit the fan and uh, you will have to find a quote unquote creative solutions, which are called probably hacks. Every game has hacks. But, you know, as a, an AI programmer, you want to avoid having like a small change, breaking something else or something bigger. And since you want to avoid that, uh, you want to, you know, having, having to retest the whole AI every time you're making such a change is, is uh, you know, it's, it's painful. If you have the time and luxury to implement it, try to have as much automated testing as possible, like you test gens, auto coverage, etc. And you know, let's be serious uh, and honest. Implementing automation must be done while the rest is being implemented. Because if you plan to do this at the end, you will just not do it. And it's fine if you don't have the time and luxury to, to to do that. But you know, we need to assume that we, if we are going to, with automated testing, you need we need to do it while we are developing the systems. Releases, you know. We're smart, we are developing AI, we're the future, it's, it's amazing. Uh, we might have the, the tendency to uh, like tell our uh, stakeholders, we will develop the system, it's gonna be perfect, uh, come see me back in two years, it's gonna be amazing. That won't work. Uh, implementing the systems then, the use cases is a very, very bad idea. We also need to keep the context in, in mind and to test. Showing results, even the smallest, as soon as uh, and often as possible, is the good way to, to work. Uh, and you know, for those working in bigger games, uh, be smart about the production phases. Conception at the beginning, uh, you know, a small small team, it's it's there to prototype and try new stuff. Uh, it's all about risk assessments and proof of concepts. Allow yourself to fail. Fail is an option because by failing, you will you know set. Uh, the technical boundaries of your system. Then as you move to pre-production, uh, it's all about getting ready for assets, missions, and systemic game to production. You know, implementing the AI from a programming perspective is just one slice of the cake. Uh, there are others as well that will depend on what you're doing. Missions, character, etc., animation, etc. Make sure you have all your core systems ready before uh, those teams are getting in the project. And in the perfect world, uh, you will use production for iteration, iteration, iteration. 
yes, it's the perfect wall. You know, there are things that aren't on plan, and you you would realize stuff uh, while while moving on. But you know, let's try to use that as get guidelines. Performances. We've been there before. Uh, we know that near the end of the project, there's a 100% chance that we will have to reduce the numbers of NPCs in some situation. It will happen. So no matter what your algorithms are, make sure they are optimized and most importantly, scalable. Also, you know, we're smart, we're doing AI, we like complicated stuff, but you know, the complexity of the algorithms um, Regarding, regarding number of NPCs, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, complex. So don't hesitate to fake and simplify when needed. You know, you don't need a, you don't need a super complicated AI to manage a massive crowd, where like crowds are basically uh, navigating on a path or fleeing a trap. And I was, as I was saying, uh, concept chain and pre-production should be used for uh, risk assessment, proof of concept. It's the perfect time to set expectation and ambitions regarding AI. If you are like developing a massive, massive, massive uh, battle system with like thousands and millions of NPCs, uh, and you're, you know, doing a test in the, on a world with just a plane, uh, without uh, graphics, it will not. Oh, sorry. It, it will not change. We need to be realistic and uh, set the boundaries. So to wrap up, as I was saying, it's all about the perception of the AI. That's cruel, but it's the truth. Uh, AI realization matters. Nobody likes uh, uncanny valleys and NPCs acting like robots, of, of course, unless they are actual robots. So the truth is, the AI perception from the player would be as good or as bad as its weakest part. So be smart where you invest your time and make sure it's balanced within the different systems and layers. And don't forget animation. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much. It's been, a it's been a real pleasure to share all this with you. Uh, don't hesitate to contact me 24 seven, uh, summer, Christmas, night, uh, it's okay. I really love to talk about everything related to AI. So uh, let's keep in touch and thanks a lot. I'm back on the webcam. Uh, so I will read the question, read them loud and just answer. So let me scroll up. Okay. Simly ask, uh, how do you realistically deal with the situation where a player or an AI runs behind an object? The key here is uh, not running or not behind an object, it's just not being stuck. Uh, so, you know, if there if there's a, you know, you have a, a room with pillars, for example, and you, you know, if you can avoid the NPCs to, um, to go too close to the those pillars, uh, you can just like, tweak your steering algorithms to make sure that the NPCs can uh, start to avoid them uh, earlier. But make sure they're not like uh, going too far from uh, those objects because it, it, it would look, just look weird. Also, uh, we need to, uh, in, in games, you, you need to have fallbacks, even if it looks like crap. Uh, for example, if you have um, crit mission, mission essential NPCs, that uh, needs to reach a certain position uh, when they are really stuck because you know in, in a systemic game you don't know where uh, obstacles can be vehicles or uh, if you have world, world destruction for example so at some points you will have to uh, teleport NPCs uh, you know we can be a bit clever uh, or more uh, you know teleport them uh, if the player is not looking in that direction but you know you don't have control on where the player is looking. So we might always have this camera looking at the NPCs, uh, stock NPC. So yeah, sometimes it's bad, but uh, we need to teleport them. Uh, make sure you teleport them in, inside the nav mesh. Another question from Simnik. Uh, I remember hearing that when hunting, foxes would avoid people by running behind trees and disappear from sight that way. Uh, 
if you tele if you teleport NPCs, they will disappear. Uh, you know, it's a fallback. We need to assume that. Uh, it's I think it's okay to re teleport them uh, in front of the player because at least the player will see uh, that they're still there. And you know, if you have decision making involved, uh, for example, if NPCs were having a, a line of sight on the player and you were chasing them, uh, you know. You don't want to create an exploit, so uh, if they're teleported, uh, make sure they still have a line of sight, or at least uh, they are able to reach the last known position. Another question from Joseph Azem: When the player is not looking, are non-essential NPCs AIs in the scene, like a marketplace active? Okay, uh, no. As I was saying, um, we uh, let's say we you're managing a crowd. So there are a huge, massive crowd. Uh, there, uh, the, the 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 point is more density than AI. You, you know, you want the the world or the marketplace to feel uh, full, not empty. Uh, so you know, it in Assassin's Creed we have like many level of details. For example, um, when the uh, the crowd are quite far from the player. You just need to have like a sense of uh, of density, so it's just like a blob of almost zombies. Uh, when they're close to the player, uh, they will they are disposable, so we can just replace them uh, and swap body parts to uh, so the player feels that they are different people. Uh, we don't mind what it's uh, what is not in the camera. What's important is what the player sees, so what's in the camera field of view. Another question from Joseph, AI pooling, yes. Um, AI pooling is uh, just like having a, um, and you know, and it's depending on the LODs. Let's say um, we have really high end NPCs and we are allowed to have um, 800 of high end NPCs. So we will just create a pool. And uh, whenever a mission, uh, cinematic, I mean, fight setup needs high end NPC. They would just like ask the pool, "Hey, give me a give me a high end NPCs." And uh, of course, we need to make sure that uh, the, it is balanced uh, within the game, and then that there are no, not too many requests to have um, high end NPCs. Same thing with uh, with crowd. So we'll just like reuse uh, the same uh, from from a pool. Another question from Joseph. Uh, it is spawn AI in radius and put in the player's field of views. It's it's always the same AI, just different meshes. Yes, um, as I was saying, we have different developed details. Um, what matters here is with uh, non-essential NPCs, crowd basically is density. Does the engine do any automatic work or do you need to implement those manually for each new type of NPCs? Uh, we have a system. We have managers and you know uh, templates and stuff, so it's ba basically just uh, automatically done by a very clever and futuristic game engine. A question from Joseph again: Can I create a crowd using a particle effect uh, for far away crowds? Yes, you can, uh, because you know it's it's mainly displaying graphics and density. The thing you need to uh, take into account is since you are using particle effects, it might be, it will be um, driven by the rendering um, code. So, uh, you know, in Assassin's Creed, uh, all the NPCs has to be aware of each other, not on an individual basis, but at least uh, conceptually speaking. And uh, more importantly, if the player can interact with uh, any, you know, high-end NPCs or like dummy crowd, if there can be an interaction with the players, it needs to be taken into account. So if your far away crowd is uh, driven by uh, the rendering code, uh, they will need to talk uh, with the AI or having some sort of uh, awareness of the player and the NPCs. Another question from Joseph. How many AIs were active at all time in ACs? Uh, it, again, 
it's not about how many AIs, you know, we can render thousands of uh, NPCs. It just, it's more about uh, managing the level of details more than how many AI. How do you know how much the player can see? Uh, we don't know. That's the, that's the challenge. Uh, and, you know, there are two things we can uh, control uh, to, to uh, minimize, uh, you know, well, not minimize, but, uh, you know, control what the, the, the player can see is first the drawing distance. Uh, the more far we draw, uh, you know, the, the more the player can see. So if we reduce the drawing distance and add some sort of fog, uh, we can limit uh, the, the distance and also the, the topology of the world. Uh, you know, if you have really long straight uh, line streets where the player can see far, far away, but if you have like a media velocity uh, or, you know, more organic with the tiny and narrow streets, then uh, you, you are limiting the, the distance and uh, you can render more NPCs uh, close to the player. Um, more questions. What's the best thing about working on a AAA game? Uh, you know, just working in games, it's it's awesome, it's amazing. Uh, you know, when you're in the in indie, uh, small teams, uh, you have that sense of control where uh, you have like so, so, not a lot of people, so they are a lot involved in a lot of things and, you know, they have their opinions on the, a lot of things that that's that's an amazing part of working in a small small team. Uh, on a triple A game, you know, big teams, uh, production values, cinematics, uh, kick ass animations, is you need to accept that you're not good at everything. You know, I've been working in AI for uh, most of my career, and I suck at art and effects and stuff, and you know, I. I that my role is to be an AI programmer, BI in the, being in the, in the AI team. But what I love about that is, you know, um, when everything, you know, and you know, in, on Assassin's Creed, we are we are different studios working on a huge game. So at one point, you know, all the pieces of the puzzle are coming together, and uh, you get to work uh, on the morning, and then you 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 realize that uh, you know the, the lighting team has. Um, added uh, lighting on the part of the world and it's amazing. It, it looks very good and you see uh, the new cinematics, new stuff uh, and you're like, wow, that's, you're kind of discovering new cool things about your own game, which is, uh, which is what I love basically in uh, AAA games and, and the whole production value as well. And uh, last questions, uh, as lead studio on the Assassin's Creed Syndicate, how does Ubisoft Montreal manage different teams to work effectively together? Uh, uh, I'm not sure to uh, understand the question, but um, uh, I'm working at Ubisoft Quebec and uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Quebec was the lead studio, so uh, it was the first time we were lead on an AC game. So, how do we manage the different teams to work uh, effectively together? Um, it's a process that we improved over the years. Uh, we had the chance to start working like that on the previous generation of consoles where the game were a little less complex than now. So it's all about trust. You need to, you know, and, and expertise. Uh, when when uh, another studio, let's say uh, the NEC studio in France are responsible for a part of the game, a part of the world, uh, they will be super uh, enthusiastic and they will be fully committed to that part. And, uh, you know, every studios are trusting the other studios and, you know, it's, we are working with, towards the same goal. Uh, and, you know, more, uh, oh, it's okay. You meant Quebec, of course, it's fine. Uh, uh, on the logistic, um, we have, you know, there's an overhead, of course, but we are assuming that overhead and we are communicating a lot. Uh, live chat or, you know, in the morning, uh, you know, I, I'm as a lead, uh, as a lead uh, gameplay programmer in, in Quebec, 
I was poking uh, everyone in the studios uh, every day, like, hello, how are you doing? Uh, is everything working fine? Can we do something to help us? Yes, it was uh, taking me some time, but uh, it, it's my job, you know. Uh, and uh, I think having a couple of uh, people in another studio helping us helps a lot more than the time it takes to me. Uh, and at the end of the, you know, uh, at the la last summer when we were closing the game, uh, we needed help on AI to, uh, you know, to, for bug fixing. So we had uh, like six, seven uh, AI programmers from uh, the Sofia studio in Bulgaria just jumped in the project to help us. And that was really like uh, appreciated and they, they helped us shift the game. And, you know, they, everyone is part of the team. That's what, that's what's cool about that. So this is it. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. And, um, Again, poke me uh, by email or Twitter or whatever, uh, smoke signals if uh, you want to talk or whatever. Cheers.